Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Ask Kate, brought to you by the Children's Tumor Foundation. So today, I want to talk a little bit about the genetics, specifically of NF1. I know we did a quick overview of each of the different types of NF recently, and we touched just really briefly on this issue within NF1, but I'm going to be using a resource developed by a coworker of mine, Heather Radke, who runs our, clinical pro, our NF clinical network and is a fabulous genetic counselor as well. And this is something that she put together um, to just help me understand and be able to explain to families that I speak to some of the ins and outs of how the genetics work when it comes to NF1. And so I wanted to share some of that information with everyone today. So basically, to begin, we need to start really at the beginning of how our genes operate in, within our bodies. So the first thing to understand is that we start with chromosomes. A chromosome is a package of genetic information, and each cell of our body has 46 chromosomes that are arranged in 23 pairs. So one chromosome in each pair is inherited from the, the mother and the other from the father. The pairs are numbered by size, so the first chromosome pair is the largest, all the way down to number 22 being the smallest. The last pair of chromosomes are the sex chromosomes, and they help determine the sex. So then within the chromosomes, you have genes. Now, genes are small areas lined up along chromosomes, and they, these are the body's blueprint or their instructions for how to build the body. So how many fingers you have and what, what color your eyes are and what your voice might sound like. Um, so that information is all blueprinted into your genes, which again are lined up on those chromosomes. So we have approximately 20,000 genes that control how we grow and develop. And each one of those genes, so we're getting for going from the big chromosome down to the, so there's 46 of those, down to about 20,000 genes that are lined up on those chromosomes. But then each one of those genes is a sequence um, that you can think of as a sentence made up of four letters, A, T, C, and G. So changes in a gene's letters, which often are called mutations, can make a gene not work the way that it's supposed to. So there are several different types of mutations that can happen, um, and this includes translocations or inversions, which just means rearranging the letters. So if the gene is supposed to be ACTG and it gets arranged AGTC, then that's going to change how that gene operates. You also have deletions, which is when letters are completely missing. Duplications, where you have an extra letter that's added in, so maybe you have two A's or two G's, or just changing a single letter in that sequence, um, so changing an A out for another C or something like that. Um, so individuals with NF1 have, mu have mutation that's in one of their two NF1 genes. You get one from each parent. Um, so that's located on chromosome 17. So when you go to NF conferences or read NF literature, you'll hear a lot about chromosome 17. The NF1 gene is an important gene in regulating cell growth and, the develop and development. So it's referred often as a tumor suppressor gene, which I always found really interesting that our body actually needs a gene that tells us not to grow tumors and regulates the growth of our cells. So the NF1 gene is um, really important for this purpose, and when you get some kind of mutation in there, it's going to change that messaging, and that's why people with NF1 will have a variety of different types of tumors that grow. The, subcut the, yeah, the subcutaneous neurofibromas, plexiform neurofibromas, um, tumors that grow in the brain or along the spine, uh, behind the eyes, um, that's all related to that gene having just a letter out of place or switched or doubled, and it changes how that gene operates. Um, so most of the time, the specific mutation that somebody has doesn't tell us a whole lot about how their NF1 is going to affect them. So there are some exceptions. One example of that would be what we call the NF1 whole gene deletion. Some people also call this a micro deletion. Um, the deletion that can also include genes that are near it. So again, we talked about how you have these chromosomes that have genes lined up on it. So the NF the NF gene, which is on chromosome 17, if it's completely deleted, and some people will see that there are genes missing on either side of it as well. Um, so those genes, uh, the surrounding genes, are often important for cognitive functioning and body development. So individuals with an NF1 gene deletion are often, but not always, um, seen as uh, having a more severe presentation than is observed in other individuals with NF1. So the NF gene, NF1 gene deletion can result in um, more serious complications medically, um, cognitive delays, 
Um, they can also have an increased risk for transformation of plexiform neurofibromas, meaning those plexiforms becoming cancerous or malignant. Um, they can have ca cardiac, meaning heart malformations. Um, scoliosis can be more common. Um, they can also have more significant learning and developmental issues. Um, and intellectual disability may actually also be present. Now again, just like with any uh, mutation in NF1, there is no guarantee. Not every child who has the whole gene deletion or that micro deletion is going to present the same way or face the exact same issues. In fact, one of the things that Children's Tumor Foundation has supported, one of the types of research, is that we'd like to understand more about what we call genotype and phenotype. So the genotype is when we're talking about what kind of a mutation somebody has. Um, the, the rearrangement or deletion or um, uh, change to those genes that are causing NF1. Phenotype is what we, when we talk about how that mutation impacts your actual physical health and development. Right now, there's not a lot known uh, connecting these two things in NF1, which is why we talk a lot about the variability. And that's very difficult for families, as I'm sure you all know, because that means if you get a child diagnosed when they're very young, you have a long time of waiting to sort of see how NF1 will impact their health, their growth, and their development. And so the more we can understand about the relationship between the type of mutation that someone has and the way that that's going to actually look in their life and their health, um, that the better information that we can give to families. Also, the, the better we know when we need to intervene, when we need to um, you know, provide some kind of um, medication or do a surgery or watch something more closely or add some type of observation to their to their medical care because because we understand that relationship. Now approximately 5% um, of individuals with NF1 will have that whole gene deletion. Um, so some of those gene changes though are pretty common. So there are some mutations that we see in lots and lots of people with NF1 but there are also some changes that are unique and specific to one family. So there's still a lot for us to learn and to understand about how um, our genetic information impacts the way that NF1 is, in, is affecting um, the individual's health and development. And it's something that we're committed to continuing to learn and to understand. So I hope that this was helpful today. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I've already been getting some emails, which is fantastic. I love hearing from you guys. Um, and I always, of course, you can leave a comment down below and please share the videos. I would love to be able to offer this resource to as many people as possible, both within and outside of the NF community. Thanks so much for joining me and I will see you next time.